Yeah, it's me. I've got it. Hold on, hold on. Say that again. Okay. work in one of these before. Now, I've just been picked up by the Durham police and told there's been a crime. And what Steve doesn't know is that he has to solve this crime and that all the clues involve liquids. All right, mate. Cheers. Hey, Steve. Hello, mate. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Peter Ablett, yeah. the director of the National Training Centre for Senior Crime Examiners. This house has been burgled. It's your challenge to be a scene of crime examiner and Sorry. recover the evidence. <laughs> scene of crime examiners help the police investigate crimes by collecting and recording the evidence. Training to become a scene of crime examiner starts with a nine-week course. Good morning, Steve. Hello, Brian. Right. Whilst you're putting your suit on, if right. I tell you what's happened, when I came here this morning, I found that these windows were open, and so I'm assuming that the thief has climbed through this window. There's something up here which appears to be blood. Yeah. And I'm going to deal with this blood first. Now, why do I have to put all this clothing on? This is to protect the scene, to make sure that you don't leave anything at the scene and confuse things. Right. So I'm taking it, I'm going to take a swab of the blood. I've dipped it into distilled water, which makes it easier for the blood to be collected. You just need a small amount. That's quite sufficient. Where will that go to? This will go to the laboratory, and they will be able to group the blood and hopefully help to tell us who has committed the crime. And the next thing I'm going to do, I'm now going to look for fingerprints here. So obviously, if he's climbed through here, I presume he's, he's, he's touched. What are you using for that? This Think. is aluminium powder, and the powder actually sticks to the sweat. So the sweat is a, is a fingerprint? The fingerprint is just sweat on the ridges of the fingers at the end of your fingers. And that's left on the wood? It's left. If you touch it, you leave an outline of your finger behind in sweat. End of the street. OK, we're down 15 minutes. It looks here as though he's written something down. He may have made a telephone call. And this pen is a biotype pen, and that looks like ink. Oh, right, because so, they bought their own pen. That's right, he could have done. So I think what I'll do, first of all, is to take possession of that we got it. Oh, it's not easy, is it? So why are we putting them in these bags? What are the, to make sure that they're protected and yeah. that nobody else touches these. You got it. Once I've taken possession of it, nobody touches it. It's now mine. Meanwhile, Sandy is investigating footprints. There are some other interesting clues here, Steve, which I've already found. And well, there's one down here, which is a shoe impression. So it's got some water in, and what I'm doing, I'm taking the water out of the footprint and I'm putting it into this jar. So this can be sent off then to the Forensic Science Laboratory and they can tell me if there's anything in the water. Liquids are often mixtures of different things. There are several ways of finding out what's in them. For example, when something like salt is added to water, most of it disappears or dissolves to make a solution. We say that salt is soluble in water. But if you add something like sand to the water, the grains will either hang in the water or form a layer at the bottom of the container. Sand is a solid and doesn't dissolve in water. It's easy to separate the sand from the water because unlike water, solids can't pass through tiny spaces. So by pouring the mixture through different filters, the sand grains get trapped while the liquid passes through to the beaker. Separating a mixture like this is called filtration. There are ways of getting the salt out of the solution. If the solution is left, the water will eventually evaporate 
but the process can be speeded up by heating it until the water boils. As the water vapor rises, it disappears. Eventually, all the water is boiled away until only the salt remains. You may wish to separate a solution of salt water and keep the water. In this case, the solution is heated in the same way, but the water vapor, or steam, is trapped and channeled into another container where it cools and returns to liquid. Separating a solution in this way is called distillation. There's also another footprint in here, Steve, but as you can see, there's quite a lot of pattern in that shoe impression. I'm going to get you to make a cast of this footprint. So if you'd like to take that bag, this is plaster. All right. We're going to get the water and we're going to mix the plaster with the water. And you're going to squeeze the bag and say so, till it's very smooth. And you're then going to pour it into there. Right, sure. so if you squeeze the plaster, squeeze the plaster, hold the top of the bag. I feel like a, this is the sort of thing they do when you break your arm, isn't it? It's just the same sort of stuff. Like... Yes, it's just like plaster of Paris. It's got to be very smooth and it's got to be no lumps in it. So <laughs> All right. Well, while that's me out then, isn't it? you're doing that and still squeezing it, I've got to spray this footmark and this is hair lacquer. It makes the sand quite firm so when you pour the plaster in, it won't destroy the pattern of the shoe. So just... I bet this will just look like a hole in the sand when I finish. We should have a nice pattern on the bottom. Like that. Now that will take a time to dry, and when it's dry, we'll be able to see what pattern is on the bottom. It's upstairs to the bedroom, but to remember not to touch anything. Oh, hello, Peter. Hi, Steve. How's it going? Oh, not too bad, actually. OK, it looks as though the burglar's been in here. This drawer's disturbed and something might be missing, but I'll get one of the other trainees to photograph it. Right. Uh, I think the best thing now is you go down and help out in the kitchen. <laughs> OK, I'll run okay. down there, then. Hi, I'm Steve. Hello, Steve. I'm Alan. Uh, now, uh, I've been to the, to the kitchen. Are there any obvious clues? Right, there are. If you look on the floor, Steve, you can see a blood stain, a tea towel. It looks like a blood stain. What we're going to do is take this tea towel, put it in this bag, and send it to the Forensic Science Laboratory for examination. Well, why, would I, why do you want to do that? Well, we want to make a comparison with the stain on the towel with the one on the window where the burglars first come in. In the front room? Right. And, uh, what, just to see if... To see if they're the same. OK. So, put, that in. put it in there. Yeah. In there. When we first came to the, to the kitchen, the bottle was lying on its side and some of the liquid had spilled onto the floor. This has since evaporated. Uh, it's a clear liquid, or a fairly clear liquid. The bottle's unmarked, so we don't know what is actually contained in that bottle. Uh, it could be dangerous. There's a rather strong smell, maybe bleach, ammonia, uh, but it could be dangerous. So, what are you going to do with that now, then? Well, the time now, Steve, to take all this to the laboratory. And this is where the second part of your challenge now comes in. <laughs> you will have to decide what all these clues mean and who was our burglar. The laboratory. Hi. Well, I'm coming to hide the uh, scene of crime training centre here in Durham. Now, I've got all the evidence. All I've got to do now is find who the criminal is. Hello, Peter. Oh, hi, Steve. Uh, look, I've got all the evidence. Right. I just don't know where to start. All right, we'll get your gloves and your coat all on right. first. Thank you. Um, now, we'll get Alan to look at uh, the footprint cast uh, that we took from the back of the house, okay? I'll take this next door with Peter. Right. Cheers, man. Now, Steve, get your gloves on. All right. Let's do the blood first. You can test the stains on the tea towel. Okay. And I will test the blood from the window. Okay, Jack. We're going to use a, a special liquid to test. There's your piece of paper there. Just fold it over and rub it on the stain quite firmly and then if you do exactly what I do now one drop of this liquid the two chemicals will react to show that the sample may be blood and if we get a green colour it tells us it's blood well done Steve. Oh, all right, so we know we've got blood I reckon we'll go to the ink on the notepad okay. we'll get the notepad out. there's the notepad <laughs> 
How can you tell if more than one ink of the same color has been used on a piece of paper? Ink is a mixture of colored dyes dissolved in water. The mixture, or solution, can be separated to show which colors it contains. It's then possible to find out what kind of ink was used. The writing on this piece of card looks as though it was drawn with one kind of black ink. We can test this by taking a sample of the ink used for each letter and placing it on a special paper that acts like blotting paper. The dish contains a small amount of chemical in the form of a liquid that will dissolve the ink. By leaving the paper to stand in the dish, the liquid will gradually soak into it and move upwards. The liquid causes the dyes in the ink to move with it up the paper. As some dyes move faster than others, they'll start to separate from each other, showing the different colors contained in the ink. The patterns that look the same were written in the same ink, but the different patterns in the other samples show that more than one ink was used on the card. Separating ink dyes in this way is called chromatography. We need to look for fingerprints on, on the notepad now. So, just the aluminium over the... Uh, no, no, we're, we're going to use a, another special liquid. So, first of all, let me tear this off. And you take the forceps. Right, now what you want to do, Steve, is just put it into that liquid. Just, just drag it. it through, drag it through, keep holding it. This it. chemical will dye any sweat from the finger that might have soaked into the paper and make it visible. Right. The page underneath okay, will also be tested. So oh. I'll lift it across for you now. All right. You can put the two pieces of paper in using the tweezers. Just trying to be really, really careful. Yeah, that's it. Uh, now this is a special oven. It's got heat and it's got humidity. So it doesn't dry the paper out. That's exactly right, Steve. So we right. need to close the door, get it firmly shut, and it's going to take about 20 minutes. This is the Hazum boat. It's really an Iron Age barge. It's made from the trunk of a massive oak tree, which was hollowed out to carry a cargo of timber and meat. But about two and a half thousand years ago, it got into difficulty and sank. It lay in water, and that preserved the wood. Archaeologists discovered it and excavated it. But if we allowed it to dry out naturally, the wood would crack, and the boat itself would collapse under its own weight. That's why we've moved it here to the museum in Hull, where the boat itself is being conserved with a special type of wax. The wax that we're using dissolves in water. That's quite unusual because ordinary candle wax won't dissolve in water. We use two types. This one is liquid at room temperatures. And what we do is mix that with the water until the wax has dissolved and then spray it on the boat. The other wax we use is like this, solid at room temperature. And what we do is add that to hot water, stir it till it dissolves, and then increase the temperature of the solution to spray on the boat. The wax that will strengthen the boat is sprayed at a very high temperature. But spraying the wax water solution in an enclosed chamber means that all the moisture is kept inside, making it very damp. At the highest temperature when the heated wax is used, it's like working in front of the steam from the spout of a kettle. Then it becomes immediately dangerous to anyone inside the chamber. It will scald our skin in about two seconds. For that reason, Dr. Foxen and his team wear special suits, which stops the damp heat inside the chamber burning their skin. Clean air is supplied into the hoods from sockets around the chamber. This special protective clothing enables Dr. Foxen's team to safely take samples from the boat to see how well the wax is replacing the water in the wood. Preserving the boat will take several years. Now that's really dangerous, isn't it, Steve? There's no label on that at all. And I think if we take the lid off and we take a sniff, it's 
smells like bleach to me, Steve. Bleach, as we know, is very dangerous. Why is this important to our investigations? Well, we don't know whether it's important or not. Right. Uh, the indication at the moment is that it was perhaps just knocked over by the burglar. Alan, this shape of the footprint has come out perfect. It's cleaned up lovely. Now, I wonder if it will match the one that we found on the window Let's try frame. It. Let's Let's see if we can make it match up. Obviously, that. Now, that's quite. That's just that about is right. Perfect. No, nice one. So we know now that the footprint on the outside matches the inside one. So all we've got to do is wait for this. Ah! Steve, it's. Oh, just, a bit of luck. Yeah, it's just come out of the oven, and you can see you've found two excellent fingerprints. Uh, I'm starting to get a rough feeling as to who it might be. Right, everyone, uh, I think before we get going, I'd like to say that our suspect, the burglars, left uh, a lot of clues. I think that they climbed in through the window. We know the window was forced. Uh, and they left uh, a, a footprint on the window sill. Uh, but also at that time, they cut themselves because there was blood on the <coughs> window itself. I think that when they realised they cut themselves, they went through to the kitchen and tried to clean it up and found this, which is the bleach. And I think they might have tried to use the bleach to maybe clean themselves down or, or just made a mistake with getting it out. So I think we can see that the bleach was definitely used, but uh, it's about as far as we can go. Oh, they also used this tea towel. I forgot about the tea towel. They used the tea towel to wipe the blood off and just drop that on the floor. So we got the blood. I then think that they probably took what they wanted and I'm sure they rang a friend maybe and wrote a message down. So I think we're looking for a burglar who's cut himself. Now, you've all got cuts. Even you, Sandy, you've got a cut there on your, on, on your arm. But... But I don't believe it's you. It's got to be. Have you got a cut? I have haven't you got, got a cut? Steve, no. Well, no I cuts. think that eliminates you then, so okay. there's no cut. They've also got big feet. This is why I don't think it's you, Sandy, because if you look at the cast that we made of the footprint, we'll notice that it's a, a, a training shoe of some type, of, and it's big. It's about a size 10 or something, about the size of my feet. So I think this is the most definite clue. And if I asked Alan <laughs> to lift up this leg, I think that we would find that this cast goes with his other foot. And so I put it to you, <laughs> Alan, that you did the burglary. Well, let's see, Steve. We'll watch the video. <laughs> And you, and you have got it right. Well done, Steve. Thanks very well much. Well done. I tell you, it's not, it's not easy. All well, the liquids that you use, you know, you've got the, you've got the, the blood and the, and the bleach and the ink, and it does get a bit get confusing. But if I've learned all that in a day, I think that I could be like on nine weeks. I'm sure you'd make an excellent scene <laughs> crime examiner, Steve. Thanks very much. Cheers. Okay, cheers. Cheers.